and we're joined now by uh, Fiona McEnay. And uh, Fiona, Director of Sport, Fair Play for Women. I was, uh, I've read, uh, I've been reading a lot of your articles over the years and the, the, some of the frustrations as well that you must have in that there is always a problem with some people wanting the results to be right for them. Yeah, and, and probably the most common argument we've heard is people saying, people in sports bodies saying, well, it doesn't really affect many people because there are only a few trans players in sports. So what's your problem? Why don't you just accommodate them? And that's a particularly frustrating argument because, first of all, nobody knows how many there are because you're not allowed to talk about it. And, and, and there are no sports bodies who are really counting. Um, you know, they might know they've got some, but they really can't say it's not a problem. Um, the second problem with that is that why, if those trans women matter, why wouldn't women and girls matter just as much? The real issue is that one trans identifying male, one male in a sport affects dozens of women. And um, you might remember, Mark, before Christmas, there was a story about a, a football, a women's football league in Sheffield, mm. where there was one male who wanted to play in a women's team. And the impact that had on, on, on all the other teams the players' own teammates were worried about training and getting hurt in training. The opposing teams were worried about getting hurt. They all said it was really unfair because this player could take the ball at one end of the field and just run up to the other end. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that, actually. Um, just to sort of let people know where we were talking about here, I think that the, the lady's name was Francesca Needham, and it was in the Sheffield Hallam area where suddenly it was ruining uh, games and certain clubs did withdraw from playing against them. Yeah, I mean, they tried to get the local FA to help them out. Um, there wasn't... The, 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 the problem we've got is that the policy that says that a, a, a male who says that they identify as a woman has priority means that that one player, Francesca Needham, was allowed to play and it didn't matter about the impact on all the others. And it, as you say, it had a, a devastating effect. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think it's a little bit like if you picture, if you remember the fast show, you remember competitive dad who could pick up the ball at one end and run to the other end. And that's what it's like because one player who's male can be so much faster that the others just don't get don't get the ball. And they were afraid of being injured if they did tackle. So mm. they just had to back off. Yeah, no, look, you, you, you make some great points. I mean, Sharon, this is, you know, you've, you've been following this down the generations. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and as I have, I mean, I have a daughter who is, uh, plays a lot of different sports. She, she played up to a reasonable standard at school. I would, the, the horrors that she would go through, though, now playing uh, possible rugby, whether it was touch or whether it was full on or um, other, even, even netball, <laughs> which sounds crazy, but there is that physicality and, and strength involved as well. You well, know, explosive I, power. You yeah. know, when you're jumping for a ball or you're defending, you know, you know there if is, you jump three feet higher, I, you're going to make a big difference. Exactly. But, but the, those that want to change everything so that the, 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 the trans women can do this together, I'll come to you, Sharon, and then to you, Fiona, is, you know, just talk to, talk to anybody at any school level who's not got themselves caught up in where the pendulum has gone, and they say, well, this is absolute rubbish. You know, we I want know, our, our daughters and sons to do what is right in their individual sports, learning what is wrong with, let's say, rugby and progressive rugby and other things that are now helping us so much more. But in other sports, that you, you can play mixed hockey, but you're not going to play mixed hockey um, for a gold medal unless everybody really is mixed. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what we also find is... Even though things like rugby, you know, rugby league, rugby union in this country and the world body have said um, they do not want males in the female game, when you get to provisional games, if somebody is playing on a team and we have a referee who's who doesn't feel empowered to do anything about it, they have to have the strength of character to be able to walk up to that person and ask them if they're male. And then if they say that they are, or even if they're not prepared to give the information, have enough commitment to be able to send them off the field. We have finding that volunteers are not volunteering anymore because they don't want to be put in that position. So that's also ruining the game, you know, as well. Um, football, we estimate that there's at least 50 trans-identifying males in the female game in the English league in this country. Mm -hmm. And many of them are goalkeepers because their explosive power is so very useful and their extra height and their, you know, bigger yeah. hands. So that's where they have a huge benefit. Um, so it, it's 
it's extremely difficult to quantify it constantly because as Fiona said, it's really hard to get these governing bodies to actually work with us and to deal with us because they're all putting their heads in the sand and they're all hoping that some terrible accident is going to happen to a different federation so that then they can all do the right thing. But if we can get them to poll, which is what we've managed to do with, you know, with swimming, with track, with rowing, those polls come out massively in favour of fair sport. So yeah. that's what they need to do. But but most of them won't even do that. We can't even get them to poll their members so they can get an honest feedback, you know, as to what their members want. Yeah. And I mean, I know it's only Twitter, but yeah. you know, I did a Twitter Twitter survey. We had sixty thousand people respond in the space of twenty four hours, and ninety seven percent said they wanted fair sport. Yeah. So one of the other things, Fiona, that really worries me at times, and having read some of these different things over 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 the last few years, is where so many of those that say testosterone suppression reduces male performance advantage to about um, to, that can compare uh, favorably with typical differences between male and female elite athletes. I'm, and and this, th th these are just stuff that, of dreams, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's absolute nonsense. I mean, and, it, and there have been maybe 18, 20 studies now published to say, forget, you're wasting your time with testosterone suppression. That's just a fig leaf. But what I, I would say, just building on what Sharon said, is that in any case in practice that doesn't happen because what you have is people turn up for a game and you know you can be refereeing or, or say umpiring a cricket match and there could be someone who's obviously male because everyone can see it mm. um but the the umpire cannot call them out for it now as it happens the ecb the england and wales cricket board they don't even bother with testosterone suppression their policy is self-id and they're saying that um you can if someone is clearly too strong, too powerful, the umpire can call them off. But we know, because we've heard from umpires and we've heard from coaches, exactly as Sharon says, they can't do that. They can't risk being called transphobic. So there's no control on this at all. And, and people can't say anything, but when they are polled anonymously, typically you get 80 to 90% of people in a sport who will say, look, I want everyone to be involved, but for the women and girls to have fair sport, they have to have a category just for themselves. Yeah, look, exactly that. Cricket was one of my main sports. And again, I, I just go back that the difference of the 40, 50 percent for upper limb strength and the way that you can deliver a ball. Yeah. And I, I mean, I'm just going to show you this report, which people can get off our website. OK, com, Because in there we've got stories from something like 25 different sports, including cricket. And those are all stories from women and girls who have been silenced in their sport um some have been actually driven out of their club uh that's how bad this is and that's why it's great that we're talking about it because mm. it's a big problem and it's a growing problem just just tell us your website now and we'll ask you and and the, and that specific paper that you've got there. yeah it's on the front page so if they go to fairplayforwomen.com they'll yeah. find it and they can yeah. download a pdf i mean i've i've tried to chase various different uh bodies of uh sports around the world <laughs> over the last five decades now and one thing that i've found a lot is very much in the way even the fa are treating all of this in this country still that they just don't really want to know and they but by not wanting to know not wanting to do it properly they seem to think the problems are going to go away mm. yeah and I mean, they're, they're just going to get worse yeah they're afraid of being sued. As Sharon yeah. says, they'd like someone else to sort it out first, so yeah. they don't have to. But we shouldn't have to wait for that because so many girls are already being put off sport um, or they're afraid or they don't want to go to the changing room because there could be a male in there, you know? So it's not because there's anything problematic about people who are trans identifying. It's simply because women and girls, want we want our own changing rooms, we want our privacy and we want our own teams. I think that's a really good point. And Sharon, you'll be able to talk more about this going right the way back. I know in it, the, the difference for you when you were a, a, a star in, in swimming was because of the dr drug cheats and other things. But w we have to remember, if you develop yourself from a very young age and you reach the pinnacle of Olympic sport, you always knew in the call room, didn't you, whether you were taking yeah. on fair, fair competitors oh, yeah. or yeah. not? 
I mean, it, for for my particular generation, which is the biggest reason that I speak out, you know, because it affected my generation and my friends so very badly, and nothing was done for 20 years. So, just for those people that that don't realise, um, the East, the old East German uh, era, these young girls were given testosterone, many from the age of 11 and 12. So they had a male puberty, and it meant that they totally dominated swimming, track and field, rowing, for literally nearly 20 years. And you know, my particular Olympics, I was one of only three people that wasn't East German that won a medal in the swimming pool. Um, and I was lucky enough to be doing a 400 meter individual medley, which is quite a long race. Um, and so therefore that endurance reduced the advantage enough so that I could beat two East Germans, but not the one who set the world record, which stood for, for nearly 18 years. Um, you know, and since then they've admitted what they were taking. Uh, we found the, the, you know, all of the records of what they were taking through no fault of their own. You know, this was young girls that were put on a system by men um, to basically sporting propaganda to win stacks of Olympic and European and world medals, which they did for an extremely long time. They had very deep voices, they had five o'clock shadows, they had poor skin, uh, they had male development, and they totally naturally dominated. And they would arrive at an international, a world or an Olympics, and we'd never seen them before. And they would go in and break a world record. And this was because of the testosterone that they had during puberty, which is nowhere near as big or as strong as males who have that testosterone through puberty. And they dominated the world of women's sport. And for 20 years, the IOC did absolutely nothing to stop it. So I have friends that came forth behind three East Germans, you know, who, whose whole lives would have been different if they had been Olympic champion. So one of the things that Fiona said, which always rings to me, is that when they say, well, it's only one or two, A, it's not, it's hundreds. We've got records of at least 800 across international sports um, that, you know, they're affecting at the moment, uh, women's results. But even if it's one, yeah. That one female that's been displaced, why is her opinions, her feelings and her equal opportunity so unimportant that she's supposed to just move over So in her own race, in her own category? Yeah. I just, it's irrelevant whether it's one or 10,000. You yeah. know, it just needs to be fair. Well, it, it, exactly that, Fiona. And I mean, w one of the questions here that I don't think half of these... Uh, uh, bosses of these sports ever really ask and and it, and it's a genuine in one in that how can we balance the inclusivity and the fairness in sport ensuring that transgender athletes have opportunities to compete while also maintaining competitive integrity that the whole question is there to be answered isn't it yeah well let me tell you what what we think um your identity doesn't matter in sport and it shouldn't no no one should be excluded from any sport because of their identity or their sexual orientation or anything else that isn't relevant all that matters is your body and your body's either male or female and we we can be inclusive of everyone by having for example as swimming have done a female in an open category so you don't have to declare anything you don't want to declare but the female category is an inclusion measure mm. that's how we let women and girls have fair sport so we can't let male bodies into female competitions. That's not inclusive. That starts to exclude women and girls. And where are we in making sure that this now is seeing sense? The pendulum on so many things over the last decade has swung a long way uh, away from how a lot of people think on a lot of things. Is it beginning to swing back? Are we getting these governing bodies to be able to sit down and listen to people like yourselves. Fiona first. Well, Sharon mentioned some of the sports that have made a change already, um, but there are many still to go, and a lot of them don't want to hear from women and girls who object. They make it very difficult for people in their own sport to speak up. Some of them will speak to us, but they still think, they seem to think that males with a trans identity matter more. And until we, you know, to me that it just seems basically sexist you know, so until we get them to recognize that the female category is the only way to have fairness for women and girls, you can't start including other people in that category, then uh, we've still got a long way to go. Yes. I mean, football, as Sharon mentioned, I think is now the biggest sport in the UK that hasn't protected the female category. And it's yeah. a big problem. Yeah, it, it really is, Sharon, isn't it? It is a big problem. Um, I think the way that we're going and the way that we, we and, and it, we shouldn't have to do this, right? The, our governing bodies should be doing this for us because it's their job to protect fair sport and it's their job to protect females as much as males. 
But the way we're going, and, and Fiona can tell you a lot more about it because she's very much in touch with Lynn, mm. is court cases. And it's been quite difficult. You know, when we've got young people, they are so intimidated to come forward. Um, and they're obviously very reliant on their sponsorship money. And so it's, it's hard to get them to break to, to break, you know, the silences. I hear it. They speak to me. They speak to Fiona. They come on the. I have phone calls every single week from from young people in tears. You know, not knowing how they deal with this. Um, and as I said, we keep trying to push the governing bodies for polling. And then when they poll, then then they you know have to be have to react. But I think court cases possibly is the way forward. And every gender gender critical court case we've had we've won yeah. um, and we've now got one happening in pool in in uh in the uk uh, lynn pinch is incredibly brave to be doing what she's doing we had it with the anglers but what we're finding is it's falling almost to middle-aged women that have got the courage of their convictions to say i'm not going to accept this i want to make my sport fair for the generations that come behind me so rather than trying to get young people to come together and you know the argument we hear all the time is well why don't young women just not race yeah. It really isn't that easy. No. You're asking them to give their dream up. You know, if they've got one Olympics in them, you're asking for them to, to walk away from that. Or they're made to sign contracts, yeah. I, which says they're not allowed to talk about these no, things. I, I, so, I understand all of, so all it's, of that. It's not as easy as them just saying, we're not going to race. You know, we do know the cyclists came together behind the scenes and they put a lot of pressure on British cycling and British cycling eventually were made to do the right thing. But they had to be literally blackmailed into doing the right thing, um, which is extraordinary, isn't yeah. it? When we have the success that we have in women's cycling, that those women's cycling were so disposable that you know they had to threaten yeah. to not be not to not to race. And Fiona, thank you very much for being part of this with us. It's something we will revisit and keep an eye on, of course, because that's what we do with this. Um, Sunday night club but a final sort of overall thought for you here where I don't really want to talk about winning and losing as far as this is concerned it because it should just all be winning yeah I think my you know what we'd like to see is more mums and dads speaking up because as Sharon explained it's really tough on girls coming up through their sport um, they're afraid of getting on the wrong side of people. They also want to be kind. Girls are schooled to be kind and be inclusive, but they're doing that at their own expense. So, so we'd love to see more mums and dads and, and, and adults generally, and frankly, men generally, saying, you know, men have fair sport. Why wouldn't women have fair sport too? Why are we having to argue for this? Let's just put it back to how it used to be. We all know the difference between male and female. Let's, let's not pretend that we don't. So, yeah, we will keep going, won't we, Sharon? We will. We will keep going. Brilliant. Fiona. We'll keep, keep it on. <laughs> Fiona, thank you very much indeed for joining us uh, tonight.